theyeshiva.net. In the time of the Beis Hamikdash, every morning of Sukkot, there was a special mitzvah, a vayda known as Nisur Chamayim. Every single morning, they would go down to the spring and fill up water and bring it back to the Beis Hamikdash, and the Kohen would pour the water on the Mizbeach on top of the altar. Now, in these days, we don't have any more than Nisr Chamayim, but tonight we're Zoyche to have Nisr Chamayim in our sukkah so we can experience a real sukkah. The water is not only being poured by the Koyan, the water is being poured by the Rebbeinu Shalaylam himself. What can be better to have a sukkah with a real Nisr Chamayim as a foretaste, as a foretaste of the real Nisr Chamayim in the base of Mikdash Ashlishi Bekorev B'Yameinu Amen. So if you have a little water pouring on your head, celebrate it. Yishalayra Simchas Beis HaShayeva. 
the whole simch of sukkahs came because of the nisach hamayim, because of the libation of the water. I know it's not exactly how it was done in the Beis Hamikdash, but listen, nobody's perfect. Even at a 24 shay, they're not perfect. They get it almost perfect, but not perfect. Chayim, 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 So the Chathila, the Chathila, when they heard the, the, the forecast, this Sukkot, as you know, the global warming came to Monsi, the Sukkot. <coughs> I don't know if it came to other parts of the world, but certainly the global warming of Sukkot came to Monsi. So when some people heard the weather for this evening, they decided to set up in the tent instead of the Sukkot. But uh, the last moment, we felt that this event should be as much as possible in the sukkah. Why? Besides it being sukkahs, well, there's another reason. <laughs> the Moran, Masech the Sukkah, Avav, brings the famous argument between Reb Shimon and the Chachamim, how many walls a sukkah needs. Reb Shimon holds you need three walls, and the fourth one, even a tefach, even a hand breath but three complete walls. The sages, the Chachamim, hold not Shtayim kill Chasam, but Hashlish is Afilu Tefam. You need two complete walls, and the third one could be even a hand breath. Two complete walls, the third one even a hand breath. And that's the halacha. The halacha is not like Rav Shimon, it's like the Chachamim, Shtayim kill Chasam, but Hashlish is Afilu Tefam. Okay, not getting into the details of exactly how you build that third wall, which is one Tefam, but there's a few details, requirements, but generally two complete walls and a little bit of a third wall, and you're good, you're good to go. Of course, it's a hidur to build a sukkah of three walls, and many a mahadit to build a complete sukkah of four walls. The Chidah writes, <coughs> Rabbi Chaim Yosef Dovid Azaloi writes, that the word sukkah consists of three letters, Samach, Chaf, Hei. And he says it symbolizes three types of sukkahs, three types of structures. Samach, what Samach? Samach is a sukkah of four walls. That's what a Samach is, a full circle. Chaf is a sukkah of three walls. It has a line on top, a horizontal line, a vertical, and another horizontal line. Three walls and one wall is open. And hay represents the minimum requirement of a sukkah. What's a hay? A hay you have two walls. You have the roof, the horizontal roof, and then you have the vertical leg coming out of the roof, and then you have then you have the little line on the left side of the hay with space on the other side which represents the third wall. So sukkah is basically the three halachic options of Adam and That's Parshat and Halach. Comes Darizal. And Darizal, the creates Chayyad, says something very special about the deeper spiritual meaning behind this sukkah structure. He says there's a Pasuk in Sheh Hashim. Pasuk says, "Smoiloi tachas l'roishi v'yeminoi techapkeni." The bride sings about the groom. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. So the Rizal says, "This is a metaphor for two times of the year: Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That's the time of year. It's the time of awe. It's the time when the left arm is more pronounced. The left arm represents." Vura, strength, discipline, judgment. Sukkis is the time of Yemina Techapkeni. The right arm embraces me. Sukkis is Mansim Chaseinu. It's a time of joy, it's a time of love, it's a time of celebration, it's a time of Gilu Ha'ava, of a relation of affection. The right arm represents, as it says in Zoyar, Chesed, Droy, Yemina, Kura, Droy, Love is represented by the right arm, and discipline is represented by the left arm. Uvechei Pei Tarkacha Hashem Alekeinu. That's what Shoshani Yom Kippur. Midas smoil the left arm. And then Sukkot, Mansim Chaseinu, Batitan Lano Hashem Alekeinu, Ba'av Amoyed Musimcha, Chagim Uzmanim Lesos, and especially this Yom Tov, the only one called Mansim Chaseinu, the time of joy, this is Yemino Techapkeinu. And the result says, where do you see this? You see this in the Sukkot. Because an arm, including a right arm, has three prakim, has three sections. The first section of the arm is from the shoulder till the elbow. That's one joint. The second section, Perik Shein, is from the elbow till the wrist. And then you have the hand itself. The hand itself, to 
on the edge of the fingers. So he says that Shtayim Tfonis, that's the two walls of Sukkot, are the first two sections of the arm. And then Vahashlish is the third wall, is the third section of the arm, is Afilu Tefach. And, he, and he, he paints actually a very graphic picture. He says when you hug somebody with your right arm, so what happens? He says, look physically, graphically how it happens. He says the first part of your, of your arm, the forearm, from the shoulder till the elbow, basically encircles the person's left waist. If you're standing in front of me and I hug you with my right arm, you mean no yitichapkeini. So the first, the forearm, encircles your left waist. Then the arm itself, from the shoulder, from the elbow till the wrist, encircles, embraces the back of the person I'm hugging. And then the actual hand comes around and encircles their right waist a little bit because it's just a hand. So the Arizal says that is what a sukkah is. Shtayim tfonis, you have two walls. Vashlish is afilu tafach. Because Hashem's right arm, kivayachal, embraces the person sitting in the sukkah. So he embraces it with all three walls. The first two walls are complete walls, like the first two sections of the arm. And then the third wall is mamash a tafach. What's a tafach? A hand breath. That's the hand itself. Now we don't just want a hug with a right arm. We want what we call a teddy bear hug. We want a full hug. You don't want just a hug, so that's why you have three walls, you have four walls, you want a full hug. But even the minimum sukkah is still a hug, you mean it to have Now the question is, Rabbi Isai, what does this really mean? It's a beautiful word, but what does it mean? What does it mean he hugs us? I mean, walls don't exactly hug. We're sitting here in a sukkah, Jews are sitting in a sukkah all over the world. What does it mean that the walls of the sukkah represent the chapkeni? Arizal says it Kabbalistically, which is always symbolic. It speaks in symbols and metaphors and riddles. But it has to be deciphered. It has to be explained. What is the meaning of this? So in Sifre Chsidis, there's an extraordinarily moving explanation to decipher and explore what is the meaning of the Arizal's words, that the walls represent the immediate of another, another impact of this. I'll just say that. Okay. So here it here is briefly. It works like this. There are different there are different ways in which you can express love to somebody that you cherish. When you want to show somebody that you love them, how do you do it? The first basic way is through words. You turn to somebody you love and you tell them. Divri Ava, Divri Chiba, you express words of affection. You say, I love you, I appreciate you, I cherish you. That's the first mechanism of communicating love. But it's not the only one. There's a deeper way of communicating love. And that's, as Rashi puts in the beginning of Shir Hashirim, Yishakeni Meneshik Espiu, Meneshikin Vayishak Yaakov, Kiss. You take your child, you say, I love you, but it's not enough. Ma! You give a kiss. Why do you have to kiss me? You already said you love me. What's the kiss? The pshat and the kiss is the love is too deep to express in words. Words are too poor to capture the full intensity of the emotion. So I have to kiss you. Oh, now you express love in a deeper way. This is the kiss in the shik. But there's yet a deeper way in which you express love. And that's the eyes, a gaze. A necha yoinim, as it says in Shehashirim, the Medrash says, lovebirds, doves, can gaze at each other for hours on end. Just looking at somebody, the profound gaze sometimes captures an intense emotion that even words and even a kiss cannot express. It's just gazing at somebody in their eyes. Two people, two lovers look at each other and the look, the gazing at each other contains within it so much depth, so much profound emotion. Because eyes express depth. Try looking at somebody in the eyes and you'll see after a few seconds, either they'll look away or they'll start a conversation. Because when you look somebody in the eyes, it's awkward, unless you're really comfortable with each other. It's not an easy thing to do. If you don't believe me, you could try it out. Just try it out in an elevator. Start staring at somebody in the eyes, they might call the police. Because the I Einayim, Einei Hashem Al Yireyav, contain a lot and express a lot. So you have words of love, you have a kiss, and then you have a gaze, a Necha Yoinim. And Shir Hashidim and other Psukim, 
They're called a necha yoinim. Your eyes are like the doves. But then there's a fourth type of affection. And that is a chibuk, a hug, an embrace. You hug somebody. But the last form is different than the other three. The first three are always directed towards the person's face. I talk to you, I look at you. I kiss you, not usually in the back. You kiss somebody in the face. And where do you and where do you look at somebody? You look them in the eyes. But where do you hug? Chibuk. Chibuk says the Malatanya Lukutatari Sukis. When you hug somebody, where do you hug them? You hug them on their back. When I hug you, I don't hug you in your cheeks usually. You hug a person in the back. All the other forms of love are directed to the face. A hug is to the back. There's one more difference. The other forms of love, we remain separate. I look at you, I speak to you, I even kiss you. A hug, I create, so to speak, a fortress around you. You can't leave even if you want. It's inseparable. What does this represent spiritually? Spiritually, hugging represents a different type of love than the first three types of love. What's the difference? There is a love that is reciprocal, meaning I love you because of what I get from you. And there is a love that's non-reciprocal, it's unconditional. I don't love you because of what I get from you. There's a love in the world, I love you, I appreciate you, I cherish you because you enrich my life. I love you because of your kindness. I love you because of your honesty. I love you because of your wisdom. I love you because of your sensitivity. I love you because of what you do for me, what you did for me, what you will do for me. I appreciate your talents, I appreciate your soul, I appreciate your beauty, I appreciate your humor. Whatever it is about you that I appreciate, it's what you are doing for my life and you're enriching it. Now that's a deep love. Don't underestimate that love. But that is a love directed towards your face. The face is the primary seat of the human personality. The face is what distinguishes one person from another person. As the Mishnah says in Sanhedrin, Lama Zayin, Ein Parksefei and Shabbos. You turn people around in the back, it's very hard to distinguish one person from another person. The face carries your unique personality. It's the seat of most of your unique disposition, the individual personality, emotions, mindset that you display, your eyes, your physique, your features, your brain, your wisdom. The face carries your uniqueness. I kiss you in your face. I look at you in your eyes. I speak to you. I don't say turn around. I want to speak to your neck, to your nape, to your back. You don't speak to a back. You speak to somebody in their face. Why? This is all a love towards you because of who you are, your unique personality and what it does for you. And then there's a hug. What's a hug? A hug, I'm hugging your back. But what's your back? What's in your back? The hug says something else. The Chibuk says, I love you not because of what you do for me, because of how you enrich my life. I love you. I love you and therefore it's unconditional. And therefore it's never going to change. Even if there comes a time you don't give back to me. Even when there's a situation I'm not getting anything from you. Even if I'm not receiving the expectations I had. Nonetheless, the love is to your essence, to your core and therefore it's unconditional. And therefore, where is it expressed? It's expressed It's an embrace to the back, and that's why it's the only type of love where there's a physical border that doesn't allow for separation because nothing could sever that connection. Because it's not, as the Mishnah says, Ava Shaheena Tluya Bidava. It's from essence to essence. My core loves your core. Essentially, our essence is one. <coughs> now, you can't expect every love to be of this level. To be able to reach this, it's very profound. We often begin many relationships because of what you do for me. Like in a marriage, you appreciate each other, you enjoy each other. But some couples graduate to the next level where the love becomes essential and unconditional. That's what the hug represents. You'll see children love words of affection. Children love being looked at sometimes. Children love being kissed sometimes. But the hug, for the infant to be held and hugged by mommy, by tati, 
that's the most powerful feeling. Because what that represents is, over here you'll be safe forever. In this bosom, you'll be secure forever. Here the affection transcends all barriers, time, space, experience, circumstances, reciprocity. This is essential. I love you unconditionally and essentially. Every Yom Tif represents, now open your hearts, every Yom Tif represents a different form of love of Hashem to the Jewish people. But there's a big difference. Pesach is Pesach. You know what Pesach means? A mouth speaks. Pesach is the Yom Tif of words. What do you do, Pesach? You got to speak. You got to tell the story. You got to speak. Shvuas. Shvuas is Yishakeni Minashikos Piyu Matan Torah was the kiss. His Dapkus Rucha Berucha, as the Zoyar says. Your spirit connects with the spirit of the one you love. Yishakeni Minashikos Piyu Rashi says is the deepest spirit in the depth of Torah. Then you have Rosh Hashanah and Kippur as the time of year. Year is the letters of Re'iyah. Hashem gazes at you when you gaze at him so Pesach he speaks and we speak Shavuos he kisses and we kiss Shami and Kippur he gazes and we gaze come Sukkis Sukkis is Sukkis is the heart where do you see that in Sukkis? think about it there's two types of relationships that Hashem has with the Jewish people and I want to say something Rabbi <laughs> Often we speak about the first part, and it's very important, but it's important equally to speak about the second type of relationship. The first relationship is, God says, I love your face. I love you because of your face. Look at this face. Look how adorable. Look how cute. Look how charming. Look how lovely. Look at the Edelkeit. The Reboi says, He sees. The depth of the Jew, the sensitivity of the Jew, the spirituality of the Jew, the refinement of the Jew, the morality of the Jew, the commitment of the Jew, the sacrifice of the Jew. I look at the face of you and the face of Klal Yisrael and I'm in love. I speak to you, I kiss you, I look at you, I look at the Ponim. I look at what the Jewish people represent, what they do, what they accomplish, what they live for, what they sacrifice for. And therefore, the relationship is based on our own face, on our commitment, on our behavior, and our, on our elevation. The more elevated Jew, the more spiritual Jew, the more you can sense the love. The more you do for your beloved, the more you could sense the reciprocal love. The more I'm sensitive to you, the more I can feel your sensitivity to me. It's dependent on that relationship. I connect to you, and as a result of that, I could feel the love that you have for me because of my connection to you. And what when I disconnect from you? The love goes silent sometimes. Sukkah is something else. Why? What's the mitzvah of sukkah? In halacha, in the Sechda Sukkah and Shukhan Arachil Chesukah, what's the definition of the mitzvah of sukkah? What is it? What do you do in the sukkah to fulfill a mitzvah? So the Gemara says, whatever you do in your house, Teshvu Kain Taduru, whatever you do in your house, you do in your sukkah, and it becomes a mitzvah, a sacred divine act. So for example, you sleep in your house. You sleep in the sukkah, it's a mitzvah. The Lashon and Gemara and Shulchan Aruch is Eichel v'shoyse v'yoyse v'yashon u'metayel. You want to take a walk? You take a walk in the sukkah. Now taking a walk is not a mitzvah. Taking a walk is not a holy act. Drinking is not a mitzvah. Sleeping is not a mitzvah. They're important things. But this is what makes us physical. This is what makes us human. There's no holiness involved. Suddenly on sukkahs, you do it in the sukkah, it's a mitzvah. Mitzvah comes from the word safsa, which means a link. You connect to God. How? Through sleeping, through strolling, through schmoozing, through socializing, through sitting around, through hanging out in the sukkah and doing what you do in your house, even if it's not a holy act, davening, learning. 
It's a mundane act that all year around it's considered mundane. It's from the Gimel Gemara. The Gemara says, Daimel the Behemoth, that we're like animals. Suddenly in the Sukkah, it's a mitzvah. Why? It's not what you do, it's where you do it. Where are you doing it? You're doing it in the Rebbe Nishalayim's embrace. Yeminay techapkeni. He's hugging you. And a hug means I hug your back, not your face. I love you the way you are. I love you. I don't love you because of what you give me. I don't love you because you're spiritual. I don't love you because you're heavenly. I don't love you because your antennas pick up transcendence. I don't love you because of your mysterious nefesh. I don't love you because of your ruchnius. That too. I just love you. I'm crazy about you. I'm crazy about you in the totality of your existence. So suddenly you're going to take a nap? You're taking a walk? You're reading a, you're reading a paper? It's in the sukkah, you connect it to me. It became a divine, holy, transcendental, spiritual life. The shechina is with you. That's a different type of love. That's the love of Yeminay Techapkeni, the chibah. The chibah goes goes to the back. And that's why, and that's why, you know, my uh, your child has a little boo-boo. And all you do is you say, oh, it's nothing, here's a band-aid. Okay. You help them practically, but you forfeited the most important opportunity. Before you put on the bandit and you give a solution, give a hug. The hug says, boo boo, no boo boo, we are together forever. That's a unique experience. So I ask you now, when was the last time somebody hugged you? When was the last time somebody hugged you for real? Now let me tell you what it means to hug somebody for real. Most people when they hug, watch people hug each other what do they do they hug you and they right away pat you on your back right ba, 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 ba. that's not a hug basically what they're saying is you're a good guy that's vita that's vita to the face that's not a hug the hug has to be vulnerable you don't hug and start patting on the back that's not vulnerable that's another you know macho thing to do a hug is you gotta let the two people melt away in each other's emotion so now i ask you when was the last time you got a hug so if you need a hug this year, you have to spend time in the sukkah. That's why I wanted it to be in the sukkah. We could have done it in the tent, and everything would have been perfect, and the video man wouldn't have to have plastics, and, and Ben Shemo wouldn't have to have plastics and make tarps so that his keyboard shouldn't get ruined tonight. But the hug, the tchapkeni is in the sukkah. And that's why you'll see, go into a sukkah, Isra Chag sukkahs. Go into the sukkah next... Uh, some chastayda next Wednesday. Make sure it's not a baltoisa. You'll figure it out. Okay, for those, make sure it's not a baltoisa. It'll be the same weather, hopefully. I don't mean like tonight, I mean like today. It'll be a beautiful weather. You'll go there. It'll be nice, but you won't, you won't have the feeling a Jew has sukkahs in the sukkah. Nobody knows what is it. You come into the sukkah in the middle of a chalamoy at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you sit down to have a cup of tea to read something, to look at something. You're talking on the telephone about something Monday. In the sukkah, there's something special. A day after sukkahs, it's gone. What? What's gone? Nobody's hugging you. The walls are walls, but there's no hug. On sukkahs, yemina techap keni. It's a hug. You're being embraced every moment in your sukkah by Hashem Himself. And trust me, lots of us need a real hug in our life, especially from God, especially from God. That's the power, that's the depth of the sukkah. That a Jew ought to know that there's a level of a relationship that's unconditional, and therefore it embraces your back as much as your face, your physical self as much as your spiritual self, your regular self, your mundane self as much as your higher self. Every Yom Tif is meant to serve as inspiration for the whole year. The inspiration that a Jew takes from Sukkot is that in the regular day, in the mundane moments, in the downers, in the stressful day-to-day -day encounters and experience people have in life, there's always a relationship with Hashem. He's always embracing you, he's always hugging you. I may fail, my face may become sour, my face may not reciprocate, I may have a lower moment, but the hug, it never affects. And on Sukkot, 
it's revealed in the very mitzvah. So there's no mitzvah like that. As they used to say, in the Chabinim of Shizchem, the only, the Einzige mitzvah was Hayid Geit Arayim with the Shmutzik Eshtivu. And here you can appreciate it. Because outside here, Baruch Hashem, a lot of mud. This place is always under construction. Because it's a preparation for the base of Mikdush Hashlishi. So this place is always under construction. I don't want to say Zeichel L'Chur, but I want to say Zeichel L'Mikdush. So that always reminds Jews that you don't never settle in America. So America is a very nice place, but it's never the permanent place. So how Jews in Muncie are comfortable, Baruch Hashem, big houses, not like Brooklyn, everybody's running away. In Muncie you can get comfortable. So the question is, how do you remind people that we're still in Golos in Muncie? The answer is, you're in a shul and one day it disappears. <laughs> And the next day a new one is created. And then the next day that one also disappears. And then the next day a tent is created. And the next day that also disappears. So between everything, Jews are reminded that with everything, we're on a, we're on a journey. We're on a journey. We're on a journey. Jewish people are on a journey from Avram Avinu to Mashiach today. In that process, you could sometimes come in with the mud. A sukkah, you come in with the boots, with the mud. I should say, wait, 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 no. Some people, you come into their house, the balabasta says, shoes off. In this house, you take off the shoes, but there's no Allah in Shulchan Aruch. You come into the sukkah, you take off your shoes. You come in with the boots, you come in with the shoes. I just mud. A poiris, shukas, shalom, aleinu, vatalam, yistov, ayur, shalayim. The Vilna Gaon says the same is true with mitzvahs, yishav, eretz, yisrael. Loi, the shittas, haramban, that yishav, eretz, yisrael is a mitzvah. You go into eretz, yisrael with your whole body. That's what the Vilna Gaon writes. The same is Sukkah. Apoyrus Sukkah Shalom Aleinu Ba'atulam Yisrael Ba'al Yerushalayim. He compares the two. The two mitzvahs that you come in with your entire body. With your entire self. With your back. Because I love you. And you means the totality of you in your raw, <coughs> naked essence. Unconditional. So I want to bless all of us and all of you. with Klal Yisrael. That this sukkah, we should be able to internalize and experience the hug, the embrace that Hashem embraces every single one of us, especially those who desperately yearn throughout their life for somebody to embrace them. And they never felt that anybody had. We should be able to look around at the walls of the sukkah and feel the immunity chabkeni, and it should carry you through throughout all the days of the year. L'chayim, l'chayim. A mikveh, he asks a good question, what about a mikveh? A mikveh, you can't go in with your dirty boots. <laughs> a mikveh, you gotta take off the boots. <laughs> a mikveh, you gotta go in in the birthday costume, but not in the boots. <laughs>
Why are they exempt from the mitzvah of sukkah? The shot is, a woman doesn't have to come into the sukkah to be hugged by Hashem. The man has to tear himself away from his regular home, and move into a new location to the embrace of God. The chiddush of the woman is, the Gemara says in Avodah Zorah, Isha command the mehila damya which is similar to the same idea. The Gemara says that the concept of the bris, the covenant with Hashem, is there naturally from birth. There's no need for the eighth day uh, bris mila. Isha commanded mehila dami. And that's why she's exempt from all the mitzvahs as shazman grama. All the mitzvahs, tefillin, shoifer, sukkah, lulav, tzitzis, tefillah, tefillah, which are all mitzvahs that allow us to connect to Hashem on a daily basis, exempt. Why? because the connection is innate. They don't have to run to shul in order to shtalzach shmeina esra. By men, it's the only way to get them to shut off their cell phone. And even that doesn't usually work. Even that usually doesn't work. There's a sign in one of the shuls, asr lehispalo b'sha'a sadibur. Usually the sign in shul is asr l'dave b'sha'a sadfili, you're not allowed to speak during davani. But there's some shuls, there's a sign, asr lehispalo b'sha'a sadibur. You're not allowed to daven while you speak. A Jew once came to the chayz of Lublin and he says, he has machshav azaras during davening. He has alien thoughts during davening. The chayzer said, I'm afraid that the davening is the machshav azara. The davening is the alien thoughts. The other thoughts are, are very common. So the man needs to be, so to speak, torn away from the regular uh, routine, the regular day-to-day uh, -day hustling and bustling in order to connect. Even sukkah, where you connect through eating and drinking and doing everything as we spoke before, but you have to go into the sukkah. You can't sit in the couch in your living room unless you have the sukkahs like they have today, quite a few homes, where the living room uh, roof opens up, as the Mishnah already brings already Masech the sukkah, the council. Then your know, mamas don't even have to move from your couch. The woman in her house, standing in the kitchen, or sitting in the living room, is already in the p'chin of Yemeni That's generally the explanation. There's a lot more ariches on this, but uh, I wanted to make sure that all the women who are here, and women are listening, and all the men should understand that and appreciate it. And the same is true with with uh, the, the distinction between men and women when it comes to many, many issues. So that's going to give you the answer to that question. One of the one of the stories that the Gemara brings, the Mishnah already in Masech the Sukkah brings about Simchas Beis Hasheeva, which was of course practiced every night of Sukkot, including this night. The Mishnah says in Sukkah that Chesidim va'Anshei Ma'isa Hoyim Beragdin. Pious Jews, Jews of great deeds, of great action, of great virtue, used to dance all night. And they used to shovel torches, flames, they used to juggle. Rashi explains they used to stand and juggle torches, burning torches, and make sure that one did not touch the other one. And no one, and not one drop. And Rashi says some did four, <coughs> some did eight, some did more. And then the Gemara clarifies the details. The Gemara says, Amr Allah Rav Shimon ben Gamliel. This is the Loshna Gemara Masech Tesuk. That they said about Rav Shimon ben Gamliel. And you have to understand who Rav Shimon ben Gamliel was. He was the Nasi. He was the leader of the Sanhedrin, meaning he held the highest spiritual position in the Jewish world. 
so to speak, the Gadol Hadar, the spiritual leader of the Jewish people, the Shimon ben Gamliel from the house of, of, of Hillel, from the house of David, that he used to, by Simchas Beis Hashem, not only he danced, he used to juggle eight torches. Not two, not four, not six, eight. And not one would fall, and he would do this for hours, and not one would drop, and none touched each other. This was what Shimon ben Gamliel used to do by Simchas Beis Hashem. And once the Gemara says this, the Gemara already goes on and says, and Levi, Levi used to juggle in front of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi eight knives. And Shmuel used to juggle eight cups of wine and no wine would spill. And Abaya would juggle eight eggs, and some say four eggs. I always found this fascinating. <laughs> You're dealing with Abaya, Shmuel, Levi, Shimon ben Gamliel. Those are the names. These were not uh, just you know athletes who spend their days in gym. These were literally the Gedolei Hadar, the spiritual teachers, scholars, leaders of the Jewish people. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel was the Nasi of the Sanhedrin, and later he was one of the Asar Rigei Malchus. He was killed by the Romans. Abaya, Shmuel, Levi. And yet it seemed like juggling was a major part of their life. I mean, imagine today. It's hard enough to find somebody who considers himself prominent to dance uninhibitedly. That itself is difficult enough, as you know. To have them start juggling? Oi, 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 what are the comments going to say on the websites? What are the pictures going to say? He's juggling? This is what the God of Hadar does, he juggled, and imagine it happened today. And yet, in the Zman Hashas, this was some Chesbe Sashev, and who did it? Chesidim Ban Shemais. Now, I can understand, you have weddings, and then suddenly the jugglers come out, and they start juggling. It's part of the fun, it's part of the entertainment. But the Mishnah talks about it. The fact that the Mishnah talks about it means it wasn't just 2 o'clock in the morning, the guys who are bored came to juggle. It means that this was part of the avoid of Simchas Beis Hashem. That's why the Mishnah talks about it, that's what the Gemara talks about. And who did it? You see who did it? Chassidim Ram Shemais and the Gedoyle Hadar. They're the ones who did the juggling. Meaning that for them the juggling wasn't just entertainment. It was essential to the whole concept of Simcha. And to the whole concept of Sukkot, the whole concept of Simcha Bisa How do you understand this? So one of the explanations is that juggling indeed represented not just the impressive, skillful act of juggling, which is impressive, but it actually captured in a symbolic way the essence of Simcha and the essence of Sukkah and the essence of Yemini Techabkeni and the core message of Simcha, one of the core messages of Simcha's Beis HaShem. You know, they tell the anecdote that there was a fellow who was speeding on the highway. He was going 125 miles per hour, so the policeman stops him. He stops on the side of the highway, the policeman comes over and uh, opens the window. Sir, you know you were driving uh, like a madman? He says, yeah, 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 I'm so sorry, but what should I do? I have a circus, I'm a juggler, I do this for a living, this is how I feed my seven kids. If I don't show up, I don't get a paycheck and my kids starve, and I'm late, there was terrible traffic. So I'm rushing to get in time for my show so I should be able to juggle. The police says, you're being honest? He says, yeah. He says, you have your juggling equipment here. He says, I have it in the trunk. He says, show me how you do it. Let's see. So the guy goes out, he opens the trunk, and he's standing on the highway, and he's juggling. He's juggling. A second car pulls up behind. This is a guy who's a little tipsy. He's coming from a sessions. He's a little tipsy, the guy in the back. Gets out of the car, goes into the police car, opens the door, and sits down in the police car. Policeman says, what do you think you're doing? He says, if this is the test, there's no way I'm gonna pass it. <laughs> you might as just put me in jail right now, it's fine. Let's just finish this off, there's no need to waste anybody's, anybody's time. But the truth is, <laughs> the truth is that in real life, everybody is a juggler. If you don't learn how to juggle, you don't learn, you can't master the art of living from the Jewish perspective. What do they say? Somebody once said, the problem in my life is I have too many balls up in the air. Today especially, everybody has balls up in the air. You're investing in this and you're investing in this. And you have to juggle. Who's not juggling? you got to juggle between your marriage, 
you work, your spiritual life, your physical life, yourself, your children, your parents, your siblings, your family, your friends, your community, God, the Jewish people. You're, who's not juggling? People are juggling all the time with the pressures and the stress. You have a mortgage and you have tuition and you have shidduchim and you have nachas and there's medical issues and financial issues, psychological issues, emotional issues. It's a felt neshalom bias issues, shvigir issues. It's a felt neshalom issues. Spiritual, emotional, psychological. Who's not juggling? Who? I don't know. The only people I know are not juggling are the people I don't know. But uh, everybody else seems, everybody that I know seems to be juggling and we have lots of balls up in the air. Lots of balls up in the air. And a person needs to juggle. But the Chiddush of Simchas Beis HaShe'eva is they weren't just juggling. They were juggling avukas shel oil. They were juggling torches of fire. The Pasuk says in Mishle, Neir Hashem Nishmas Odeh. The soul of a person is called a Neir. It's a flame. Just like the flame always rises, always kisses the ear, always licks the ear, always sways, is always aspiring to go higher. Every flame rises, shall have his oil, as Rashi says in Baalai This nishmas adam, that's the neir Hashem. It's a neir that gravitates, it yearns. We're not just juggling. We're juggling a vukah The neir Hashem nishmas adam, a Jew needs to learn how to juggle. What happens when you juggle? <laughs> I'm not a professional juggler, but I do try to juggle in some other areas. <laughs> As some of you also try to juggle. You throw up one avuka, you throw up one torch, but it's not gonna stay up forever. You have your few moments that it's up, and if you know how to do it high, and you do it with a lot of strength, it may stay up for another few seconds, but it's soon coming down. But as one is up, you're holding on to one. And then the other one comes down and the other one goes up. And so it alternates between one goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And that rhythm must be perfect, skilled, impeccable, flawless. And you got to dance to the beat, especially if it's Simchas Beis Hashever at a wedding. And you have uh, Ben Shimon uh, the playing the music, whoever's playing the music, and you got to juggle to the rhythm. What does this represent spiritually in a person's life? There are two types of people. I call them AM people and FM people. People, when they go into the car, they put on AM radio. Unless you're listening to uh, the Shiurim, you should be listening to in the car. But if not, there's people who turn on AM and there's people who turn on FM. What's the difference between AM people and FM people? In AM, the world is always coming to an end. Either it's Trump or it's Hillary or Obama or the Holland Tunnel is backed up for the next hour and a half. The Triborough is even worse, and the Verrazano Bridge and the George Washington, forget about it. There was an accident. In AM, there's always a crisis. Here it's a crisis of the debate, here it's a crisis of elections, here it's a crisis of Putin, here it's a crisis of global warming, here it's a crisis of the Middle East, but there's always another crisis. That's AM. FM, eh, no Holland Tunnel, no Verrazano, no GW, nothing is ever backed up. The music gate and gate, the same music playing for 190 years since the Chet Eitzadas. The same music playing and everybody's relaxed. So now I ask you, are you an AM personality or are you an FM personality? Now the best is when you're married to a person who's either an AM or an FM, life is always interesting. And most marriages, of course, one is an AM and one is an FM, that's part of God sends a humor, like Teva Yes, Adam Levada, SLA, Eze Kenegde, as the Nitziv says, Eze Kenegde means the best help is to somebody who is opposite personality than you, so she could save you from your own ego. So you say one thing, and she says, of course, you're wrong. Somebody asked me once if he states an opinion in the forest and his wife is not there, if he's still wrong. So I told him. You're, you're a fool, you have no seichel. You think your wife needs you to state your opinion to know what you think? She disagrees with you even before you went and stated her opinion. She smells what your opinion is. But you have really two personalities. You have people who live a very uh, terrestrial life. AM personalities. They're always changing. Top of the hour news. You give me 22 minutes, and I'll give you news. And I'm going to make sure that at the end of that news, you're anxious, you're nervous, because America is coming to an end. Whoever wins, this one, that one, there's no future. You're moving to Canada, as we know. 
anxious because you're present, you're in the world, and the world is on a sugar nava. And then there's FFP, aloof, detached, sublime. They create their own cocoon and they live there. What's the way to live? Should you be an AM personality or an FM personality? AM personalities look at FM personalities and they'll always say, as your wife tells you, you're out for lunch. You're a nice kid, but you're naive. You're just detached from reality. And the FM personality looks at the AM personality and says, Nebuch, you take the world so seriously. <laughs> so I'll have a love all of them. So I'll have a love all of them. Relax. Come into my cocoon. Come into my sukkah. Come into my Yemini Techapkeini. What's the right way? What's the right path? <laughs> and the truth is, this is what the great giants of Judaism taught us. The art of a Jew is that you have to juggle. There's always a part of flame that has to be up. But there's another flame, another torch that has to be down. When you juggle, there's always an avuka that stays up. In other words, a part of you always should be connected to the higher place. A part of you that's aloof, that doesn't get enmeshed, entangled, stressed out, and overwhelmed by the text message, by the email, by the new bill that came, a part of you that remains in a sacred, heavenly space, in the Rebbeinu Shalom's embrace. The Gemara says in, uh, in Shabbos, Taflamet, al pi Hashem Yisu, al pi Hashem Yachanu, keman de domi. The Jewish people, they were traveling in the desert, al pi Hashem, based on God's GPS, God's positioning system. So with Kaman de Kviladam, they were always in the same place. You could travel 40 years, but you're always in the same place. Because you're being hugged, you're embraced. Chaim Shmulevich's famous marshal, you were there at the Musa Shmuz when he said it. So he was there at the Musa Shmuz when Chaim Shmulevich said it. Shemesh Shmuel also said it a generation earlier, but Chaim Shmulevich gives the marshal. You have a, a woman travels the world, travels the face to five continents, 20 countries, and every place has passport controls and, and customs and security and lines and taxis and stress. She goes from, from Sydney to Tel Aviv to Moscow to Miami to Los Angeles to Honolulu to Johannesburg to Caracas. From one side of the world to the other side of the world, and it's as stressful as it gets. But the main thing is, in your passport, you have all the side signatures that you were here, and then you have pictures to prove. But then, if she happens to be holding an infant, a baby, and you can ask the baby, "Where have you been in all these weeks and all these months?" The baby will say, "Oh, I was in my mother's arms, in the same place." Ah, your mother went from one end of the world to the other end of the world. That's my mother's problem, not my problem. I was in my mother's arms. They 40 years they traveled, but they were in the same place. They were in the same place. They felt that they were in the embrace of Hashem. They were in a sukkah. The Gemara in Masech the Sukkah Daf Yeralef has an argument between Rebbe and Rebbe Akiva. What's the Sukkah Sir Shafti? Rebbe Lezer says, Anani Akavit. And Rebbe Akiva says, Sukkah Smamish, Hutz. So the Shulchan Aruch Paskins like Rebbe Lezer, that it was Anani Akavit. But whatever it was, Ki Besukkah Sir Shafti, Ki Mandi Kvi Yiludam, they were in one place. So Ki Lahavdil, the FM personality, there's always a flame, a torch, the Neshama, part of your Neshama got to be up. In English, we call it, we say every day you have to have what they call downtime. Downtime means you shut the door, you shut off the phone, and you just connect to yourself, to your essence, to your identity. In Yiddishkeit, we don't call it downtime, we call it uptime. There's moments in the day when the world shuts down. A Jew is davening. A Jew is answering Amin Yehoshmei Rabba, a Yid is saying Tilim, saying Pesukah Zimra, saying Krishna, Davidim Shemin Esra, learning a Vlad Gemara, learning a Perek Mishnais, learning a Pasuk Chumash, whatever it is, it's times that the torch is up. It's up time. Aloof, sublime, transcendent, and disconnected from the enmeshment and entanglement with stress, the stressful world. But we weren't created to live in heaven. We were created to live in earth. We were created to change the world, to transform the landscape of our planet. The Rambam says in Ilfus Hanukkah, the end of Ilfus Hanukkah. Torah wasn't, it wasn't created for heavens. 
this is the Gemara in Shabbos, Pechaz, the Malachim wanted the Torah, and Moshe said, Klum Yetzahara Yesh Benecha, you have issues with stealing, you have issues with Loisachma, you have issues with murder, you have issues with theft, you have issues with adultery. Torah was given for humans down here to change the world and to refine humanity and to refine the earth. So if you stay up, your soul stays up, you're forfeiting your purpose. It's beautiful. But this is what's called the Cheskel says, Achayis Rotsoy Rishoy. The angelic beings are always in a, in a um, dual state. Rotsu, you're running up, Rishoy, you gotta come back. You go up, the Nisham has to come back down. And it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. A part of you, aloof. Another part of you, present, real immediately here, imminent and intimate. You're present, you're not detached. You could listen to a person's challenges and be in tune. Don't just say it's all out have a It's all worthless, that's not how you listen to a person. You start singing, the person comes to you, your therapist, the person comes to you and tells you about all of their issues and they say, that's not what you do. You say, what do you mean, it's a hot emes. No, no, no. You have to be able to be present in life. Your child comes home and has a little boo-boo. You don't say, oh, when you're going to be older, it's going to become insignificant. And your child comes home from a date and they're completely confused. And you say, yeah, you'll be my age. You're going to laugh about these times. Thank you. When I'll be your age, I'll laugh. Somebody once said, what's the difference between a 20-year-old and a 40-year-old and a 60-year-old? A 20-year-old is self-conscious. Any 20-year-olds here? Are you self-conscious? Okay, very good. Wow, that's pretty good. This is Hamad Reagan. Every 20 year old knows, if you're honest, you're self-conscious. How do I sit? Is the video picking me up? What do I look like? Who do I fit in with? Who are my friends? Who are not my friends? What type of guy am I? What type of bach am I considered? Etc. Etc. When I come out of the freezer, what are they going to say about me? And all the good things. That was for the BMG boys. So that's one level. That's one level. You're 20 years old and you're very concerned who you are and how they look at you and what you're standing in the kihila is. Then you're 40 years old. You know what happens when you're 40 years old? You're 40, okay. When you're 40, you say, you know what? I don't care what they think about me. You like me, good. You don't like me, oich, good. This is who I am. This is how I'm going to live. I'm not going to live my life to be Yotzer for the Shvige, for the Zedah, for the Baba, for the Elta Baba, for the Cholom, Shecholom, Wacherem, Alacherem, what I'm supposed to be, what I'm not supposed to be. This is who I am. Embrace it or reject it. You don't like it, don't look at me. Or look and don't like it. And when you're 60 years old, you realize nobody was ever looking at you. <laughs> okay, so now go tell a 20-year-old, why don't you be like a 60-year-old? Why don't you be? You have to see the big picture. We all know that the concerns we had when we were 14 are not the concerns we have when we're 21. And the concerns you have when you're 21, trust me, will not be the concerns you have when you're 31. And the concerns of a 35-year-old are not the concerns of a 65-year-old. And the Oilam says, I can't speak from experience, that what you're thinking about when you're 30, 40, 60, when you're 98, it really doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter. So tell a 30-year-old, when you're going to be 98, this is not going to matter, it shouldn't matter now. You have to be present in people's lives. You have to be in tune to yourself, you have to be in tune to other people. That's shuv. A soul needs to be present. Part of the soul, up. And part of the soul, down. And a Jew could alternate between AM and FM. There's always a part that's connected to a space that is free. Stress free. Al pi Hashem Yisu, al pi Hashem Yachinu Yiminit Echapkeni. And there's another part of the soul that's very present in the vicissitudes. Do I pronounce that word correctly? Vicissitudes. Okay. Very good. Now explain all Evelich Hasidim what that word means. That's present in all of the Shinuyim, the fluctuations, the roller coaster, the Aliyah's Vyiridus of life. And that Simchas Beis HaSheyeva, for somebody who masters the art of juggling, can be truly joyous in life. Simcha comes from the synthesis between the ability to be able to look at the world and always be connected to something above and yet never be detached, knowing that ultimately the one who's above has to come down. 
that'll come back down. The Rambam Paskins, the Mishnah from Yuma, at the end of Yom Kippur, what did the Kohen Gadol do? He would leave the Beis HaMikdash, and how Yehoylech Lebeis. Why does the Rambam have to say this in Hilchus Avodah Yom Kippur? This is the Halacha. We should he go Mitzvah Yom Kippur to the bowling alley? Where do you think the Kohen Gadol should go Mitzvah Yom Kippur after he comes out of the Holy of Holy? He should go to a pizza shop? He should go to the 59 for pizza? Where do you want him to go? You want him to get sushi? You want him to go? Where do you want him to go? Of course he goes home. Where should he go? It's a halacha. It's a halacha. How do you know Yom Kippur was Yom Kippur? If after Yom Kippur you go home. If you can't bring Yom Kippur into the house, it wasn't Yom Kippur. If you always have to stay up and the moment you come home, suddenly you're a different person. There's people that in shul, when they say Nagdisha, when they say Keser, they close their eyes. They pick up their hands. Nakdisha Keser. When they come home, when they come into the business, they come into the office, they can backstab, they can insult, they can holler, they can denigrate. It wasn't Yom Kippur. If you can't take it home, you weren't there. How do I know you were up? If you can come down. But you can't stay down, you have to go back up. And it's a paradox. And it took Reb Shimon Ben Gamliel. It took Levi, it took Shmuel, it took Abaya. It wasn't simple. It took the Chsidim Van Shemaisen to teach us that the art of the life of the Jew is the art of juggling. Chaim, Chaim. Flex good. Flex good. Like as if I buy a juggle four, juggle eight, and Shimon and Gamliel, Zoyvik. It's deep stuff. There's four layers to the Neshama. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayim. And then there's the fifth level, Yechida. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayim. It says in Medrash, Arba Shemes Nikru Law. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayim, Yechida. Nefesh is the biological electricity of the soul, that we're alive. Ruach is the emotive ability. Neshama is the cognitive ability. Chai is the spiritual component. And Yechida is undefined. It's one with Hashem. Chelek Yechida is never juggling. Is never, is never, uh, is never up. And is never in motion. It's always one. The four torches are Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chai. Over there, it goes up and down. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, that's with our, our body. <laughs>
Shem Tov. It's brought in quite a few smart of the late episodes from the times and the days of the Baal Shem Tov. That one year he built a sukkah for sukkahs. It was in Mezhebush, which was the city where he lived in the Ukraine. Mezhebush was a city in the Ukraine. And the sukkah was extremely problematic halachically. It was filled with every possible loophole that a sukkah could have. As you know, anybody who learned the Sakhti Sukkah, Ufa Sukkah, you know that a sukkah is a unique mitzvah, but almost every possible loophole, and I mean the word loophole quite literally, every possible gap and hole, somehow works very often with a sukkah. You have a din of daifun akuma, and you have a din of lovud, and you have a din of good asik mechitzos, and you have a din of good achis mechitzos, <coughs> and you have a din of avir <coughs> pachis mishloish, and you have a din of schach posel pachis merba. You can have gaps and holes and roofs and overhangs, and as long as you know what you're doing, as long as you know how to figure it out, this taka, this sukkah taka, had a shtikel mice of doifen akuma, meaning that between the wall and the schach, there was a, an overhang. So the problem is that the person just didn't know doifen akuma has a limit. It's called arba amas. You can't just have a doifen akuma make the wall crooked twenty amas. So uh, the doifen akuma was exaggerated a little bit. So it had to be fixed. It was fixed. It was a kosher sukkah. The balshemtiv sukkah that year had every possible heter, loophole, gap in halacha. <coughs> a few rabbonim heard about it, <coughs> local rabbis, and they came to examine the sukkah before sukkahs. And they took a look, and they scrutinized the sukkah, and they told the Valshantiv, this is a puzzle of sukkah. You're not going to sit in the sukkah. You're not fulfilling the mitzvah. And the Valshantiv argued that it's a kosher sukkah. And it was so problematic that it was subject to a debate. It was not clear. There was a problem with the trees. The question was how much buckle would have not buckled not would have. There was a problem of gaps and holes and wall. Every possible problem there was. The walls didn't come down, the walls didn't go up. Every hector he used and it was full of problems. And the Bashantov argued that it's a kashmas. They said it's a possible. And the story goes that uh, the Balshamtiv at some point he couldn't convince them. And they wanted it to clear up sack that the the, the, the sukkah is possible. The Balshamtiv put his he, his holy hat hand on his head. And he went into a dvekas. He went into a spirit a trance, so to speak, for a few minutes. <coughs> and uh, he came out. He landed, and he opened his hand, and he showed him that there's a note in the hand in his hand. And they took out the note and they opened the note. And the note read as follows: Sukkas. The sukkah of the Baal Shem Tov is kosher, signed Malach Matat, Malach Matat, Sarapanet. Sarapanet. One of the famous Malachim, it's born in Gemara also, in Chagig and other places. So you have many places. Malach Matat, Men Tes Tes, Sarapanet. Doesn't mean the interior minister. It means the ruler of Ponim, of Plinius, of Faces. And Malach Matat signs that Sukkot Sibir Sol Vashem But they said, okay, if you get these notes, if you get these notes from Malach Matat, they went. And the Vashem Tev used the Sukkot. Sukkot and nobody objected. Which at first glance, and the note came to his grandson, the Degel Machin Ephraim. Somebody writes, he saw, he saw the note by the Degel Machin Ephraim, Sukkot Sibir Sol Vashem Tev he used the note to heal people for two years. Nobody died in the city. And then finally, he put it under the head of a sick person. And then the note disappeared. And he said, from heaven, you know, people can't live forever. Okay, there was a whole story about how the note evolved. It went to the, to the Rishus, to the domain of his grandson, the author of Degel Machin Ephraim, who's the Reb Moshe Ephraim from Sedlikov, who's buried near his grandfather in Mezhebush in the oil of the Bolshakta. But I want to ask a question. What's the shot of this story? Every Jew wants to do Hidur Mitzvah. You can do the Mitzvah, and you can do the Mitzvah beautifully. Especially the Mitzvah of Sukkah. The Torah says in Avodah it's a Mitzvah Kala, it's an easy Mitzvah. 
why, even if it's habuta, even if it's kosher, why does the Baal have to create a sukha that many Rabbonim, Talmidei Chachamim, they weren't uh, peasants from the street, should object to it, and you need a heavenly note to kashi a sukkah. What's the point? You need to make such kunsa. And how hard is it to repair a sukkah and avoid the problems? They said it's not kosher. It wasn't on Yom Tif. The Baal Shem Tif could come and say, okay, you take a plank here, a board here, a piece of schach here, you cut this, you cut that. I mean, it might be a young people do it. You fix up the sukkah. You dafka have to prove, no, it's going to remain a blemish sukkah and it's going to be kosher. The Gemara says in Chulin, that he says, I never ate Nevel and Treif. I never ate Treif. The Gemara says, Yecheskel and Avi never ate Treif. Jews don't eat Treif. He says, I didn't eat from an animal that was questionable. There was a Shaila, and they went to a Chachem, they went to a Rav, and he said, it's kosher. I already didn't eat from it. Why? Not because it wasn't kosher. Because there was a Shaila, there was a question. This is the Gemara brings in Chulun about Yecheskel. In other words, that... He didn't want to get into questions. He didn't want to get into problems. And here the Baal Shem Tov insisted on having a problematic blemish sukkah. How do you understand this? So one of the explanations in this is very relevant to today's times, I think. Extremely relevant. The Gemara says in Masech the Sukkot of Chavzayin, Chavzayin on the base, the Sukkot teish v'shiv asyam, and Sukkot says without a vav. So it could be read, the sukkas. You should sit in one sukkah, not in plural, not many sukkahs, one sukkah. Call Yisrael Ruuyin Leisha Bishsukkah. Theoretically, the entire Jewish nation could sit in one sukkah. All you need is one sukkah. And from this, the Gemara proves that sukkah shaula is kosher. Unlike Lulav, the first day it has to be Lachem. It has to be yours, not borrowed. When it comes to a sukkah, I don't have to live in my sukkah. I could borrow your sukkah, and I could stay in your sukkah, and I fulfill the mitzvah even the first day. I, by sukkah, it also says lachem. The answer is, because it says, besukkahs, teishu, kol yisrael ruy elisha besukkahs. Rashi has his explanation in the sukkah. Teishu has his explanation in the sukkah. It's a separate discussion. All Jews are worthy of sitting in one sukkah. It's an interesting expression in the modern it doesn't only mean halachically we can all use the same sukkah. For that, the Gemara didn't have to use this poetic expression. The whole Kalal Yisrael is roy to sit in one sukkah. The Gemara could have said simple sukkah shulak shayna. Doesn't have to get so poetic. Kol Yisrael ruuyim leishem sukkah. Gemara, of course, is intimating a deeper dimension. And that's why it's brought in many svarim, especially in Teres Hanister. Sifri Machshav, Sifri Ashkaf, Sifri Musa, Sifri Chsidus, Sifri Kabbalah. That the sukkah is a type of reality that has the capacity to embrace all of Klal Yisrael. Kol Yisrael Ruyim Leishim Sukkah. And if you come to a Jew and you say, you don't belong in the sukkah, you don't have a place in my sukkah, then it's not a sukkah. A sukkah is a space where every single Jew ought to feel embraced ought to feel the Yeminah de Chabkeni the Hulk. That's the definition of a sukkah. The sukkahs, call Yisrael Ruim Leishem sukkahs. The Baal Shem Tev could have built a perfect sukkah, beautiful sukkah. You know, you come into some sukkahs, and say, ah, I'm a chay. It's perfect. You have the air conditioner on one side, the heater on the other side. You know, you suck all the decorations, every conceivable type of decoration. Bamboos, Mahadra should be Mahadra, Idus should be Idus, you picked up from a Japanese garden. And then uh, you have not only mats, you have real bamboos and schach and uh, outs. And the walls, not stuck, it's mahogany wood, it's not stuck. If not mahogany, at least cedar. And it's four walls, and the door is beautiful, and there's a window, and there's a second window, and there's an entrance, and there's an exit for, for, for to come in and to come out. Everything. And as the Ramos says, if you could be machmer and build a second sukkah just for you and your wife, is matoiv. So you have a perfect sukkah. That's what the Ramos, the Ramos says in the Simit of Rishlam Tess. If you could be machmer and build a private sukkah so you could say have the mitzvah of being with some echazishta inside the mitzvah of sleeping in sukkah. Matoiv, if not, you're oisik a mitzvah, but a mitzvah, the Taz explains about sleeping in a sukkah. Okay. You have a perfect, perfect sukkah. And who walks in there? 
walks in there, a Jew who also feels perfect. And he sits down in the sukkah, and he feels, ah, this is my, my place. But we all know that there are people who are not perfect, present company, of course, excluded. And there are people who don't feel perfect. There are people, you look at them, and they look like a doif and a kum. A doif and a kum. You look at people and their lives are filled with gaps, filled with holes. Nothing is complete. Here they need lovewood. And here they need to put down the mechitza. And here they need to put up the mechitza. The walls are not there. Their boundaries have been violated. Walls represents boundaries in halacha. All of Masechta Erevin is based on this. There's boundaries. Tchumim. Here is my domain. Here is your domain. There are physical boundaries. There are emotional boundaries. Emotional boundaries are as important as physical boundaries, and they're dependent one on another. There are people whose boundaries have been violated. The walls did not come down all the way, or the walls did not go up all the way. They were not protected. These are lots of people, especially in today's generation when it has surfaced. It used to be that Jews loved Hollywood kitchens and wall-to-wall -wall carpets. Every Balabata Shadid needed a Hollywood kitchen and wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Why did you need a wall-to-wall -wall carpet? So I said once, because you need a lot of place to put things under the rug. So if you're not gonna have a wall-to-wall -wall carpet, you won't have enough place. Today, the style is to get rid of the carpets. Balabusters don't like carpets. So things emerge from under the rug. The Baal Shem Tev asked one question. Who's gonna feel comfortable in my sukkah? I want that my sukkah should be able to be a home, not only for the perfect souls, not only for the unblemished souls, I want that every type of soul, even people who struggle, people who have ups and people who have downs and people whose walls and boundaries have been violated, they, have, they need a good asik and they need a good achis. They need to create new walls and sometimes imaginary boundaries because they never had. People who have so many gaps and so many holes and so many voids and so many empty spaces and they need the dinim of lovewood and they need the dinim of avir, less than three tfachim. And people who have schach possible, the people who covered them and protected them were not valid, were disqualified, were not worthy, were not suitable to be a roof over their heads. All these types of souls represented in a flawed sukkah, a blemished sukkah. The Baal Shem Tov said, in my sukkah, I need every soul to feel that it's his or her home. In my sukkah, nobody is going to feel unwelcome. Nobody's going to feel that this is not a space that they could call their own. That Judaism will not accommodate their souls. And I want to show you the contrast between two Yom and Tov. Take a look at Pesach and take a look at Sukkot. Pesach, you clean your home. And you clean your home from every mashu of Chomets. As the Rosh says, even Psachim, even Chamas that becomes unedible, you're allowed to have it, but you stroll Kedoshimhe, the Rosh says, they get rid of it. They don't want Chamas even that's not edible. They clean out the house by your by your Matzah, unless you just go to a hotel and then it's there. You sell your house, Eichot. But the point is, the, the house has to be perfect. And Balabastas, men and women and children work for weeks, sometimes for months, some people start right after Sukkot. Cleaning their house, so that by Purim already, you can put signs on all the door, no food, no food whatsoever. Sure. Some people already, Shivasa Batamas, there's no food allowed in the house. That's why they come here to eat. Because Shivasa Batamas is already clean for Pesach. Okay, everyone with their mices. As one Rav told a woman who came to complain, and he said, you have to remember two things about Pesach. Number one, dust is not chametz, and number two, the children are not the carbon Pesach. Two things you have to remember. Dust was never was chametz, and children are never called a sacrifice of Pesach. We don't believe in sacrificing children. That's what Avram Avinu, the first Jew, learned very early on. God doesn't want children as sacrifices. That's not Judaism. We don't believe in children's sacrifices. Okay. So Pesach, the house is perfect. And if there's a mashu, 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 no way. And they have every week Rabbi Blumenkrantz's book, and every year another 50 pages get added. Because all of the new mices, the new medicines, the new ingredients, the new healthy food, every year, do you see? I don't know, in 20 years, our grandchildren, our children are gonna have to read through, I don't know, worse than Tolstoy. (laughs) 
since we're talking about embracing every Jew, so Woody Allen once said that he took a lesson in speed reading. So he read Tolstoy's War and Peace in 20 minutes. And he could say that it's about Russia. So, so you have, you have these, these guides, these guides for Pesach. These guides for Pesach, and it's infinite. It's infinite. And then you know that the cultural chumras that people have every community, right? Some of us grew up and some of us continue to squeeze the oranges. Erev Pesach, you stand and you squeeze the oranges to make oranges. And you check the salt and you cook the sugar. And every community, kol chad v'chad from sure delay. And some people do a chumra, but a chumra, but a chumra, but a chumra. They will eat almost nothing on Pesach. That's Pesach. That's the halachas of Pesach. Suddenly it comes sukkah. The opposite. Doifen akuma, good. Good acid, good. Good aches. You have a broken, blemished sukkah. It's all good. What happened? What happened with Pesach? The answer, Rabbi Yisai, is open your hearts. On Pesach, we invite Hashem into our homes. On Sukkot, Hashem invites us into His home. On Pesach, you invite Hashem into your house. You have to prepare the house. The king is coming, the Melech Malcham Lachim is coming, prepare the house. If there's a Khshash Chametz, get rid of it. Sukkis, Hashem invites us into his house. Sukkis, his house. Sukkis, Yemine Techapkeni, we go out of our house. We go into his house. His house is made of Psoilus Goyrin Viyake. The Gemara says, Ba'os Pechami Garn Chomi Yekvecha. Psoilus Goyrin Viyake. If you put a tomato, not good. You put an orange and a peach, it grows from the ground. No, it's edible. We want psoilus goyden v'yeke, psoilus. The residue, the straw, the bamboos, the planks of wood that are not edible, they're not usable, and therefore they're not makabal tumah. They're not a meichel, they're not eaten, not by a person, they're not eaten. They're not a meichel. That's what you put, that's my roof. That's my roof. That's my granite counter. That's my big, he invites you to his home. If he invites the Jewish people to his home, he says, my home has space for everybody. My home has space for broken souls. My home has space for souls that have gaps and holes and voids. People who feel crooked and people who feel that their stature has been compromised. He's a doifin akuma, this chach posel, this avir. The wall doesn't go up fully, the wall doesn't go down fully. There's this issue, that issue. In my home, there's space for everybody. You're welcome. And that's the, the, that's the definition, that's the message of Sukkot. Do we create a Yiddish guide in which every soul feels that this is my space, this is my home? And it's not just the broken souls. Who's not? Who's not blemished, who's not compromised, who's not broken, but it's even deeper. The question is on every person. Which part of you goes into the sukkah? Which part of you shows up in the presence of God? Must I show up with my perfect self? Or can I show up with the totality of myself? Can I show up with my psoilus goyden v'yekev? Can I show up with all dimensions of my personality? Or... Do we create shuls, schools, communities, camps, seminaries, chadarim, talmatoides, bote midrash, kehillas, where when you want to show up, you got to be perfect. You got to look perfect. You got to speak perfect. You got to project perfection. If not, you don't fit in here. I have all the issues, and everybody knows that everybody has issues, that you take to your therapy. That has no place in God's home. The Baal Shem Tov says, not my sukkah. Not in my sukkah. But it's even more than this. His sukkah wasn't a sukkah that had all the hetairi, mela. His sukkah was a sukkah that everybody else said it's possible. Why did he have to do that? Make a sukkah with gaps. But let it be kosher according to everybody. They knew halacha. No. He had to make a sukkah that was at the edge the edge. Everybody said it's not good and he needed heaven to embrace his sukkah. Now of course, there's a question, they should have they should have declared the Gemara Baba Metziah pay download, Amad Reb Yeshua Araglov, yeah? But Amad, turn away by Shemayimi, Amad Shkichim Abbasko, Malach Matat, doesn't tell us Hilchah Sukkah. 
You want Hilchis Sukkah, you learn Shulchan Aruch. Open up Hilchis Sukkah. Learn Tafri Shlamet Vav, Tafri Shlamet Zay. Learn Hilchis Sukkah. Learn Mesech the Sukkah. We don't listen to Malach Matat. Okay, so from a Lamdisha perspective, from a, from a Halachic perspective, I would say perhaps that Malach Matat wasn't telling them the Halach. Malach Matat was challenging them to revisit their logic. He was shaking them up to say, go through the sugis again. Go through again. He wasn't paskening the halacha. Novi asul achadish dover, as the Rambam says in the Chesed Even a novi. Why? There's a system of how halacha is communicated. And the system is here on earth. It's not in heaven. The Gemara Bab Metziah says there was a machloik between Kutshebrich or Masif to Derekiah. So you have to understand exactly what that means. Heaven is arguing with Hashem. Baharis kaidem l'seir lovon. If it's a suffolk, Rabbi Bar Nachmani, <coughs> Rabbi Bar Nachmani paskin star. And the Rambam paskins kivayochel in a way that seems like not like, not like the the psak of heaven. Okay. But what they was, Malach Matat was saying is, I want to challenge your way of thinking. Revisit Allah and you'll see the conclusion. But why such an extreme sukkah? Because there are souls that some people say, even with all the gaps and all the holes, they don't come in there. They don't. This sukkah is too far. It's accommodating too much. But the Baal Shem Tev, the soul of the Baal Shem Tev said, we don't give up on any soul. Even the soul that people look at and say, this soul has no place here. To make this plug so comfortable, your sukkah is stretching too much. You're destroying your sukkah. It's not a good sukkah. The Baal Shem Tev is ready to go to the furthest extreme. If it's halachically sound, he won't violate halacha chalila. But he will go to the furthest extreme to embrace the soul. And heaven, heaven agrees with the Baal Shem Tev. Reminds me, there's a very powerful word from the Moshem it's, it's uniquely powerful. The Gemara says, "Kol hador be'eretz Yisrael, doyme kemishi yesh le'aleka. Kol hador bechutz laaretz, doyme kemishi ein le'aleka." It's a very powerful statement, especially for all of us who live on the west of the Atlantic Ocean, not on the east of the Atlantic. Whoever lives in Eretz Yisrael, doyme, it's comparable. It appears that they have a God. If you live in Chutz Laaretz, doyme, it looks like you don't have a God. That's the Gemara. It needs Hezbed and Mepharshim deal with this, struggle with this. What does it mean? What does it mean? But here's the Baal Shem Tev, who as always is often counterintuitive. So he says doyme means it appears, but it's not the reality. It's not the reality. So everyone says, of course, there's a Jew in Chutz Lars doesn't have a God. Of course he has a God. It's Daima. It looks like. It appears. Baal Shem Tev says, no, no, no. It means much more than that. These are two types of Jews. Now listen to this. There's a Jew who lives in Eretz Yisrael. We're not talking only physically, geographically. We're talking spiritually. Eretz Yisrael is a land of Kedusha. There's a Jew who believes that he lives in the land of perfection, in an oasis of holiness, in a transcendental cocoon. He feels that he has reached spiritual perfection. In his mind, he has a God. The Baal Shem Tov says it's only in his mind. In his mind, he has a God. Really, if you feel you're spiritually perfect, you have no God. Because the definition of God is infinity. <coughs> Then you have the Jew who feels like he lives in Chutz Laaretz. He always feels that he's outside of holiness. He thinks he doesn't have a God. He thinks he doesn't have it, but he has. Doyme, he thinks he doesn't have it. He has. That's why he has. Because he's open, he's curious, he's inquisitive, and he's humble. He's humble, he's open to growth. So it's easy to look at a person, they feel like I'm an Eretz Yisrael, I feel so accomplished, so perfect. I have a God, the Bible says, you think you have a God. What does that mean? It means I could be looking at two people. And one person thinks he has a God, one person thinks he doesn't. 
the Baal Shem Tov says that's exactly the point. He thinks he has and he does not. The other person thinks he does not. And he actually has. And when you know people on a deep level, you know how true this is. You know how authentic it is. Because sometimes in the humility, in the struggle, in the dilemma, in the search, you have the depth of the ruchnias of a person, the depth of dvekas. The moment you feel you have God, you have anything but Him. Leis machshavet fisabe. It's elusive. It's mysterious. It's infinite. You're searching. You feel you're in chutz laaretz. Doyme kemishen leyalaka. But it's only doyme. In reality, yesh leyalaka. So here is my que- here is our question: Does our sukkah create space? for our perfect dimensions or also for our imperfect dimensions? Does your sukkah, does your home, does your community, does your heart, does your soul, does your shul, does your marriage, does your oasis welcome Jews who are imperfect? And do they welcome the part of you that's imperfect? Do you show up to Hashem with all of yourself? Or you can show up with all of yourself. Because part of yourself you had to bury before you came into the sukkah, before you came into shul, before you showed up. And if you have to bury part of yourself that you're not showing up, then it's doyma, then it's doyma kemishi yesh Then you dar Eretz Yisrael. You demand, we only accept people who live in Eretz Yisrael symbolically. Oye gewalt. You're losing the real touch, you're losing the authentic touch of Judaism. Where did the Baal Shem Tov get this idea from? Gemara and Sukkah. Kol Yisrael, Uyim Leisha B'Sukkah Achaz. Kol Yisrael means every Jew. Not only the Jews that look like me and Dav and my Nusach. So if my Sukkah says one Jew is not Roi, a Sukkah is a snish. It's a beautiful place. But the real status of what a Sukkah is, if you feel not Roi in this place, Hashem Tov says not. This is not a real Sukkah. Real sukkah is a space where everyone feels comfortable. Where everybody feels that they're being hugged. Where everybody feels that they're being embraced. I bless you and all of us that we should have the courage, the serenity, and the vision to be able to create such sukkahs, to be able to create such homes, to be able to create such shuls, to be able to create such schools. This is not about compromising truth, chas v'shom, or halacha. This is about understanding the depth of the human journey. L'chaim, l'chaim,
Gemara says in Masech the Sukkah, when they get an asterisk, Pasuk says, "Ol kachtem lochem bayem arishin priyets other kapus priyets other kapus tomorrow manafets others varvi nacha." It doesn't say an asterisk. It says you should take a tree of a fruit that's beautiful. Maybe it's a peach. Maybe it's a lemon. Maybe it's a mango. Maybe it's a watermelon. So the Gemara asks, "How do we know it's an asterisk?" It's true that for generations Jews always knew it's an Esther because when Moshe gave the Torah, he gave most of the oral interpretation together with Torah Shabbat The Rambam says in the Hagdam and the other Chazaka Torah, the Fidush of Litna. Nonetheless, it's all could be found in the text. Where do you find Esther can create something? So the Gemara gives four or five different interpretations. One of them is that, yeah, there's no Nekudis in the Sefer Torah, there's no vow. We could pronounce different words in different ways. So we pronounce it creates hadar, the fruit of a tree that's beautiful, but it could also be pronounced hadar. Hey, dalad reish could be pronounced hadar, which means it lives. You know, every fruit lives. What it says, creates hadar is hadar bi ilonai mishana lashan. A citron, a citron, an asterisk is a unique fruit. Most fruits, they have their season when they become ripe. Once they become ripe, you can't leave them on the tree. Either they fall off on their own, it becomes too heavy, just falls off the tree, or it decomposes, it starts getting dry and rotten, it becomes decadent. It can't continue into the seasons that are not suitable for the fruit once it's ripe. It comes, it's time, it's time for harvest. Either if you har- either you harvest it, or it falls off, or it, uh, or it decays. It decays. An estric is unique. It's a fruit that it's dor It remains on the tree throughout all the seasons and it continues to grow. So if you harvest it, you harvest it. But if you leave it on the tree, it will remain not only fresh, alive, and vibrant, it will continue to become larger and larger. That's why you see some asragum are not small asragum, some asragum are large asragum. Sometimes you see 747 uh, jumbo asragum. It's the same asterisk, same asterisk tree. You leave the asterisk, an asterisk I believe could remain on the tree two years, three years, sometimes more years. I know so some asterisk told me, somebody told me an asterisk merchant, he said, a asterisk me so five years on a tree. It doesn't exist in other fruits. What's the Havana in this? The Havana is, that's Pshat, pre eights Hadar, Hadar. It continues to live. The tree becomes its dear, it lives there, just like a home. You're in the same home today, people have already summer homes. But you have the same home, summer, winter, spring, fall, autumn, it's your home. Hadar! The asterisk lives, it lives on the tree, the tree becomes its only shana lashana. It lives through the year, and it lives the next year, and it can live the next year, and it continues to live until you harvest it. It doesn't dry up, it doesn't fall off, under normal circumstances, under ordinary circumstances. That's pre Hadar. If this is the source of how we know pre Hadar means asterisk, it means in Torah everything is bedirik, everything is precise. It means that this is connected to the uniqueness of Esri. It means that this is one of the reasons that Torah chose an Esri. Because the quality of Hadar Bilonim Mishana Lashana is something that is essential to Simcha. It's essential to Zman Simcha Sein. What is the concept of Hadar Bilonim Mishana Lashana, the way it applies to people's lives? What's the reason a fruit can't remain on a tree forever? Because different seasons work for it. Some fruits need the cold, some fruits need the heat, some fruits need the spring, some fruits need the summer. But you come to the wrong season, the season is not good, we're not a good shidduch anymore. <coughs> so therefore I can't remain on the tree, either I fall off, or I rat, or you take me off. What's the uniqueness of the asterisk? It endures all the seasons. No season doesn't work for it. Every season is fine with it. Not only that, it grows from every season. Not only does it sit well with every season, every season somehow promotes its growth. What does this mean in people's lives? Life, as you know, is never the same. There's no one season of life. It would be nice, but summer doesn't last forever. Spring doesn't last forever. Winter also doesn't last forever. I saw in my, uh, in my backyard the over Sukkot, the leaves of one of the trees became absolute red. Gorgeous. The foliage, the change of color. Gorgeous, red. Today already, the 
color was changed. A day or two, and the color is changed. Yellow, brownish, it's already going downward. Seasons change, colors change, leaves change, trees change, people change. There's no one season in life. Sometimes the sun is shining, and sometimes the sun is not shining. There's hot days, there's cool days, there's freezing days, and everything in between. There are many seasons. That's the story of life. Or to go back to what we discussed before, the Chazal didn't just juggle fiery torches. They juggled torches of fire. Shmuel juggled cups of wine. Levi juggled knives. And Abaya juggled eggs. You think this is some random? No, no, no. There's different things you're dealing with in life. Sometimes you're dealing with wine. Wine, of course, represents simcha, joy. Wine is the symbol of joy. Make kiddush on wine. We celebrate the chasana on wine. We celebrate simchas with wine. There's wine, and then there's eggs. Eggs, as you know, represents grief. It represents chalila avelis. The avil eats an egg for sudas avro after levaya. Because it says right, the beitz ain't like pet. We we take a beitz on the seder. Zeichel lechagiga, zeichel lechorbin. Beya, the egg represents grief. Avelus, it's a different type of experience. There's a knife. Sometimes you're dealing with confrontational issues. You're dealing with a confrontation. Somebody wants to hurt you. You're dealing with a difficult. You have an adversary. You have a position. You're dealing with confrontation. So you have eggs, you have wine, you have knives, and then you have avuka shaloy. And then sometimes you're dealing with very passionate situations, very emotional situations, intense situations, fiery situations. And the primary element of Neir is Neir Hashem Nishma Sadhu, you're dealing with spiritual situations. And in every situation you have to learn the art of juggling. One torch remains up, and one comes down, as discussed before, in all of these situations. But life seasons change. Now, some people, they grow from one season. But when they come into a new season, now they wither away. The Esrig was chosen because the ability of the human being to be able not just to live in all seasons, but to grow from all seasons. Whatever season I'm in, I should be able to grow from it. I should be able to take from it a message, an energy, momentum, to make it a catalyst for growth. That's the uniqueness of Esther. It doesn't only survive on the tree all, all year. It thrives on the tree. It thrives on the tree all year. I, it's opposite seasons. That's the Chiddush of the Esther. The Chiddush of the Esther is, today it's cold, tomorrow it's hot. When it's cold, I grow from it. And when it's hot, I also grow from it. And that's a unique skill. Because these people, if you put them in certain situations, they'll grow. You put them in another environment, that's it. I'm dead. I'm worthless. Life is over. I'm in a depression. You can't be an asterisk. Zman <laughs> Simchaseinu is with the asterisk. You have to learn how Darby Loni Mishan Mishan. There was the Rebbe Rayatz, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe. His name was Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Shneirson. He's known as the Rebbe Rayatz. He passed away Yud Shvat, 1950, Tov Yud in New York. He came to America. He was living in Warsaw. He escaped to Warsaw. And he was under Nazi occupation in Warsaw. And he ultimately escaped Warsaw to Berlin from all places. From Berlin to Stockholm. And then he made it... In March 1940, Adir Shani Tovshin, he came to New York. Shortly after he arrived to the United States of America, he said a vart. He arrived Adir Shani, and I believe he said this vart on Pesach. I heard this from Mayid, the parish of Fogelman, who was in New York at the time. I don't know if you heard the vart from the Rebbe's mouth, or you heard it from somebody who heard it, but I heard it from him. The Rebbe said as follows We say in Halal, every day of Sukkot, we say in Halal. In Ma'ashiv Lashem Kotab Muloyi Eloy. What do we say? Ono Hashem 
כי אני עבדך. אני עבדך בן המסך, פיתחת ומסר. How does, how do people touch? Onna Hashem ki ani avdach. So we say, Onna Hashem, please, Onna, we beseech you, Hashem, ki ani avdach, I'm your servant, be here for me. But that's wrong, because Onna, which means please, I ask of you, like Onna Hashem, I shear now, how is it spelled? Aleph, nun, Aleph. Onna, Aleph, nun, Aleph, like Hoshayna, Hoshia, no. Help me, please, I ask you, I beseech you, that's Aleph, nun, Aleph. Ono, Ono Rachim, Ono Chus V'Rachim Olein, please. In that Posik, Ono is not spelled with an Aleph at the end. Ono is spelled with a He at the end. Aleph Nun He. What does Aleph Nun He mean? Aleph Nun He doesn't mean please. Aleph Nun He means we're. Ono, right? Ono Selech, where are you going? Ono, we're. So Ono Hashem Kani Avdecha doesn't mean please God help me because I'm your servant. Ono means we're. So the Rebbe Taich, the Rebbe Dayat Taich, does it. Ona Hashem, I'll say it in Yiddish and then I'll translate. Ona Hashem, Zog mir vudu vilstich zol zayin, ki ani avdech. Zog mir vudu vilstich zol zayin, ki ani avdech. Right when he came to America, the transformation from Europe to the United States, he said this word. A Jew tells Hashem, Ona Hashem, tell me where you want me to be. Wherever you want. Ki ani avdech, because I'm your servant. Today you want me here? I'm here. I'll embrace it with oomph. I'll embrace it with passion. Tomorrow you want me there? I'll be there. I. this is winter, this is summer. I'm an esthetic. Kiani Avdechel. I'm your ambassador. An ambassador of four years you're here. And sometimes you're here and you're sent here. You're a shliach, you're on a mission. We say in Abdoy Noilam on Shabbos, what do we say? They're happy to go out and they're thrilled to come back. What? Well, something is wrong. <laughs> if you're happy to leave your house in the morning, you're not so happy to come back. <laughs> if you love leaving, then you don't like here being here. <laughs> if you love staying, then you don't like leaving. Smechem b'tseisam, the sauce of the When you send them out, they're dancing. When you bring them back, they're dancing again. How does that work? The answer is oisim be'ema, ritzoyin kaima. Since now the will of my Creator is to go out, and now the will is to come in, so sauce of smechem, oisim be'em ritzoyin kaima. So the esrik says, on Hashem. Who will do? Where do you want I should be? Here. I'm your servant. Listen, they say a Maisa about the two brothers, the Rebbe of Melech and the Rebbe of Zusha. The Rebbe of Zusha of Anapoli. He had the name of Melech, the Rebbe Melech of Lezhens. And his brother was Rebbe Zusha of Anapoli. They were two great tzaddikim, and they went, they did what's called Golos. There were many tzaddikim, they would go for a year or two, and they would wander, they wouldn't sleep in one city more than one night to see what's happening with their brothers and sisters in Eastern Europe and to refine themselves. The Vilmagon did it, Abed Tzadikim did it. So Reb Zusha and Reb Melech did goals. They say a story that one night somebody informed upon them to the local authorities or police and they threw them both into prison. So you have Reb Zusha and Reb Melech are in prison, it's a cell and there's no uh, basic utilities over there. And uh, this is, you know, the late 1700s. And all they have in the corner of the cell, they have a big bucket and a pail. And that's what people use for, uh, for their needs, to, for, you know, to, to tend to their physical needs. So you can appreciate or understand somewhat of the reyach nechoyach, or absence of it, the unique odor that uh, permeated the ambiance of the cell, to put it politely. It comes in the morning, as much as they can sleep, and the Rebbe of Zisha sees the Rebbe of Melech, his brother, that Melech is white weeping. Echlippet is crying. So he says, Brude was veins to white crying. So Melech says, What do you mean? How can I not cry? How logically you're not allowed to daven in this place. You can't say Hashem's name, you can't say Krishna, you can't say Brachas, you can't say Tvil. You can't. Such a smell, such a day of cry, you're not allowed to daven. So that's why I'm crying. So the Zusha says, Why are you crying? So you can't daven. 
is the first time in my life I won't be dominant. First time in my life. So this brother, I guess, plays a little dumb, and he says, okay, there's a first time for everything. So he won't doubt. He says, what do you mean? When I don't daven, I don't have a relationship with Hashem today. I don't have a relationship with Hashem today. I feel detached. I'm fragmented. I'm not a whole person. Davening tefillah is meloshen ha-toifel klei cheres. Tefillah doesn't really mean prayer. Tefillah means connection, alignment. The Mishnah says ha-toifel klei cheres. You put together, you sew together. You sew together yourself with yourself, with your real self, with your soul. Tefillah is the time that you connect to the truth of your identity, to the truth of the world, to the core of reality, to the presence of Hashem. And today, I will be disconnected, I'll be disjointed, I'll be detached from God, from myself, from my true self. So Reb Zusha says, one second, who says? What? You connect to Hashem by fulfilling His will. Every day Hashem wants you to daven. Today, Shulchan Aruch says, you don't, you're not allowed to daven. So by you're not davening, das gufa is a chalois in halacha. You're not, not davening because you're sluggish, because uh, you're, you're in a bad mood. You're not davening because it says in Shulchan Aruch not to daven. In other words, you're fulfilling Hashem's will through not davening. So you're connecting to Hashem by fulfilling His will. So today you'll connect through not davening. Every day you connect to davening. And today you'll connect through not davening because the same God who wants you to daven, today He wants you not to daven. So today you won't daven and that's how you'll connect to Hashem. Interesting? Of course. You think God is not here because there's a garbage can? The same God says, well, there's a garbage can. How do you connect? Through not davening. It's also a connection. It's a different type, but it's a connection. So instead of crying, he starts singing. And since it's two chesedim, so they start dancing. So within five minutes, the prison cell turned in to a simchas teire de kishtibu. They were dancing, and all the prisoners joined along. They're dancing kazat, because it looked like it was Purim. The prison warden hears a commotion. He took a little peeks into the cell, and he sees dozens of people, metan, celebrity, they're dancing. It's not what a prison is for. It's made to crush people. So he runs in. He calls out one of the inmates, and he says, What's this tans all about? Why are you dancing? So, of course, he points to the two Jews in the middle of the circle, and he says, they are guilty. They instigated everything. I mean, it's always the Jewish people's fault. It's always Israel's fault. They did it. Okay, but why are they dancing? Why are they dancing? The man says, I don't know, some deep mystical reason. He says, tell me why they're dancing. Says, I don't know why they're dancing. He says, if you don't tell me why they're dancing, I will place you in solitary confinement for a month. Tell me why they're dancing. So uh, this man points to the bucket in the corner of the room. The prison warden says, that's why they're dancing? He says, yeah. He says, how can this bucket filled with human fertilizer make anybody dance? So they say, somehow they explain that through this bucket they developed a new type of relationship with God. <laughs> there was the pre-bucket relationship and the post-bucket relationship. Before the bucket had one type of connection. And through the bucket they came to discover a whole different type of relationship and they're getting very excited about it. So the prison warden says, really? I will teach these Jews a lesson. And what does he do? <laughs> he takes the bucket and he throws it out of the room. So the Bzusha turns to the Beli Melech and he says, Bruder, yet can't the davening. My brother, now you can start davening. But it's not just a story. There's a profound message in the story. You're always in a relationship. You're always, you're always in the Aminei Techapkeni. You're always in an embrace. Sometimes the relationship consists of the Rebbeinu Shalom saying, I want your davening. And sometimes the relationship is, now is the time not to daven. Daber el Bnei Yisrael v'Yisrael. Moshe breaks the luchas. And Hashem says, Yashikaychecha Sheshibart. Thank you for breaking there are times that a Jew could give wholesome luchas. And there's times a Jew can't bring wholesome luchas. The luchas are broken. They're broken. 
He's with a place, and there's a bucket filled of filled with, uh, let's call it spaghetti. There's a bucket filled with things that don't allow him to bring bro the wholesome luchas. But who says he wants your wholesome luchas? Maybe sometimes he wants shibarta. Maybe sometimes he wants broken luchas. The same luchas were in the same aren in the Holy of Holies. Who said the Kaidish HaKadoshim was only made up of whole luchas? The Kaidish HaKadoshim was made up also of shivri luchas. Also Menachem Bar. The Gemara Baba Basra. Lucha is vishivri luchas Menachem Bar. Ono Hashem ki ani avdecha. Tell me where you want me to be. I'm your heaven. That's the uniqueness of the Esrik. Hador bi ilonoi mishana l'shana. Not only does the Esrik not get nispal, not get affected from climate change. We talk today about climate change. We talk today about how the climates change. There's physical climates, and then there's spiritual climates, and there's emotional climates. And then who doesn't change, and who doesn't live in a world of change? The uniqueness of the Esrik is, not only do you endure change, every change you could look at and ask yourself one question. How am I going to grow from it? How will I become a better person, a deeper person, a more real person, a more godly person? On Hashem, Kiani Avdach, Chayim, Chayim,
I see that the season is changing for the Esther. <laughs> So the circumstances change. <coughs> I saw this in a safer. I have to say that uh, I found it very amusing. I know not everybody will find it so amusing, but I found it amusing. Everybody asks the question, what's the mystery of the Aravis and Yishai Ram? The whole sukkah is you shake the ruler of the others, the Esther, the, the, the Hadas, the Aravis, the Esther, together. Suddenly Yishai Ram, who becomes a Yuchis? You don't take out the Hadas. You don't take out the Lulav. You don't take the Esther. You take the Aravis, it takes five separate Aravis, whatever the thing it is, and you hold them and the Klapse. Mishnah calls it Yom Shvi Shav Arava, the day of Arava. Why did Arava get the Sikhs? In the base of Mikdash, in fact, every day they used to take a separate Arava. What else we only do with the seventh day of Sukkot? So I saw somebody wrote in a Savior. He wrote as follows. He says, it says in Medrash, everybody knows in Medrash, in the four minutes, there's presently four types of Jews. Everybody knows. The Esri has a taste or a smell. Jew has Torah and it's Mahadas is a smell without taste. Jew with Torah with uh, mitzvahs but no Torah. Lulav has a smell. Lulav has a taste but no smell. Yeshbei Tam is Torah without mitzvahs, without mitzvahs. And Arava? Arava is nothing. No taste, no smell. Ingrid like Torah with mitzvahs. So the Arava is the real Amaharitz. The real ignorant Jew doesn't learn, doesn't do. Nonetheless, a whole sukkah you connect it with Lulav, the Hadras, and the Esri. As the message says, they come together, you also hold them a good act. You see, it writes in the safe, I know what's going to happen. After seven days, the Arav is going to start feeling the Ma'aretz may start feeling good about himself. He's in the same company with the Esri, with the Hadras, with the Lulav. He's going to start feeling that he's a person. A fine schmeck, he's a good guy. So you shine it out, but we teach him a lesson. Take out the Amaharits, take them on clap, you pound them on the ground. And what do you say? What do you say about the Shinos? The mandas called Amaharits. Yashemu al Kimeno. Gotta teach the Amaharits a lesson. Six days we tolerated you. We covered the umpty who were quiet, you know, for Shalom Bias. You were nice. But don't think. A new year is coming, this part of We have a hierarchy. We clap them five times. And this he writes it seriously. Same type of mitzvahs. It's all about respect. I was a boy. The Bible should have used to speak every night so much. After my living, half an hour, an hour, something wrong. Schmack, it's like a schmack. Many years. One year was a Shanirab. Toshin Mem Dawi. He's quite a young boy, 1983. So the Bible should have asked the same shot. So shine it up, it's a yichis with a rov, with a rov. Spoke an hour about it. I want to say one or two things. The same question, a little bit of a different answer. A little bit of a different answer. What hack connects the Dalit Mina? If they're so different, what connects them? And you're not Yoitze without one. Morris says, Dalit Mina, Ma'ak, Vin you don't have an Arava, you don't say, okay, we'll do it anyway. You're not Yoitz. It says to do it, but there's no mitzvah, there's no mitzvah, no mitzvah, no key mitzvah. You do it, but there's if you don't have one, but it's not, it's ma'ak, it's not like Tzvil and Shayyad and Tzvil and So what's Taka, what unifies them? What unifies them? They're so different in personality, they're so different in behavior, they're so different in demeanor. 
This one has a taste, no smell. This one has both. What connects all of them? What connects all of them, the Emma says, that they're all Yid. They're all Jews. Because they're all Jews, they're all essentially connected to Hashem. This one is connected in this way. This one is connected, this one has a taste. A taste goes into you and it's a mechayim. A smell, when you take it in, may not be so gishmak, but it has a good smell. You know you have four types of people. You have a person, they leave a very good impression when you meet them. They have a good smell. A reyach. But once you taste them, once you spend some time with them, once you take them in, it's not so gishmak. Other people, the first time you meet them, you know, think about your best friend. The first, if you would have only known him from the first meeting, you probably would have never become close. Once you taste them, it's a Some people have saya taste and saya smell, and some people have neither. Iruchnius, this one is the koch is in Torah, and this one the koch is in Maisim Torah, and this one the koch is in both, the Esrit. And then there's a Jew, no koch in Torah, no koch in Maisim Torah. Abba is Ayid, is Ayid. It reminds me, Shlomo Lekalbach told the story. He visited Dizeldorf, Dizeldorf, Dizeldorf in Germany. He visited Dizeldorf. And he was walking at night in Düsseldorf. And a Jew come, a person, it didn't look like a Jew, comes out of a bar, <coughs> a little tipsy. And he sees Shloimala. He's with a yamalke, with a beard, with payas, with tzitzis. So he looks at him. Now Shloimala grew up in Germany. His father was the Rav in Baden, in Deutschland, in Germany. He looks at Kalbach and he says, Du bist ein Jude? You're a Jew? He says, Ja. Ich bin euch ein Jude. I'm also a Jew. But I'm a different type of Jew than you. My parents were Jewish. And during the war, they realized we will all die. So they gave me to a Christian neighbor to raise me. I always knew that I was Jewish, but I never ever did anything Jewish in my life. I know I'm Jewish. But I never did anything Jewish in my life. Not only that, he says, I don't think I ever did anything good in my life. So he turns to him and he says, did you ever meet the worst Jew in the world? You just met him. That's me. Ich bin das ärgste Jude in der Welt. I'm the worst Jew in the world. That's me. And Shlemel said, he told over the story, he says, and then the Jew looks at me and he picks up both of his hands and he says, Das erikste Jude of the world. Abe doch ein Jude. I'm the worst Jew in the world. But yet, I'm a Jew. So he said, you know, people talk about who they met. This one met this Rebbe, this one met this Tzaddik, this one met this Rosh Hashim, this one met this great man. And they're proud of who the great people they met. He says, I'm proud, not of the greatest Jew I met, but of the worst Jew I met. Doch ein Jude. He felt it. Doch, das ergste Jude, aber doch ein Jude. Da Rava, doch ein Jude. So they come together. That's what comes out on Sukkot Yiminei Techapkeini. In the hug, all the children come together because you're not being hugged because of your talents or your IQ, or your creativity, or even the nachas that you give me. I'm hugging your back as much as your face. That's all the six days of circus. He says, but here's the difference. The Arava never makes a mistake. It always knows why it was chosen as one of the Dalit. It knows it was not because of its own Perfection. <laughs> it never deceives itself that it was chosen because of its yichas and therefore it never develops an ego. But the esrig and the hadas and the lula, they help in the geval the commandments. So often during the six days, they were chosen 
not because the pshittas, not because of the simple, unconditional relationship, but it's because of their individual talent, which makes them feel superior to the other. And that compromises purity, even though the truth is they're also like the Arab. But they sometimes don't feel the simple relationship that they have a lot of things to cover it over. He gave an example. He says there's two types of children. Sometimes they have a child who's perfect. His behavior is so powerful that even though you love him, not because of his behavior, you love him because he's a child, but because you love him also because he gives you so much nachas, it eclipses the unconditional love. Sometimes parents have a child who is a vegetable, physically or emotionally, can't give anything back. There, the deepest love comes out because it's not, it's not soiled, it's not, uh, it's not fapachkit by anything but pure love. So he says, hey, Shana Rabbe, you celebrate our Rabbe. Hey, Shana Rabbe, you celebrate our Rabbe because our Rabbe brings out a relationship that is absolutely pure, that is absolutely unconditional, that even the Lulav and the Eswig and the Hados don't have. And that's why it's the only day Yerushalmi says, Chazal say, Hoshana Rabbah was Dirch Shabbos, meaning they would do it even on Shabbos in the base of Mekdash. And today, Hoshana Rabbah can't be on Shabbos. They made the calendar that Hoshana Rabbah is not on Shabbos. Why? So the Bavli Taka holds not, but the Yerushalmi holds. Yeah, the calendar was made by a uh, right, pillow from Talmud of Yerushalmi, so he follows that the whole lot. Hoshana Rabbah can't be Shabbos. So it's a Pele de Kazakh, Toys for Sask, other Hoshana where Shoshana could be on Shabbos, and you don't blow Shaifa. The first day of Sukkot could be on Shabbos, and you don't shake Lulav. These are mitzvahs min ha Clapping on our Rav on Hoshana Rabbah is not a mitzvah min ha It's not even a mitzvah de Rabbana. It's a minig nevi'im. That's why you don't make a brach. You don't make a brach. So Shaifa, you don't blow. Lulav, you don't blow. Because some years it's Shabbos. Clapping or shyness, they never cancel. <coughs> because since it brings out the relationship in its purest way, there's never a year that it's not shy. <coughs> there's never a situation that that relationship is not there. So Mela halachically, it also came out that there's no kvias that a shiny rabbi will be canceled out in terms of our office. So that's the true energy of sukkahs. Side the wolf, side the hadas, side the other side the esrik. Of every Jew. And the Mela the Balshemt of Sukkah, that will include every Jew. Side the Lulu, side the Esuk, side the Hadda, side the This is not only with another person, it's also with yourself. Every person has components in where they're the best, and then sometimes they look at themselves and they say, Ich this extra. So it's not Pshad, your love, despite that. It's Pshad that sometimes. That quality, that component, is your deepest component. Because it's what keeps you real, authentic, human, and vulnerable. May all of us build sukkahs in our lives, and in the lives of our loved ones, in the lives of Klal Yisrael, that could make every Jew, every soul, feel the minoy techapkeni, the chiduk, this class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.